Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Hey guys, welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Joe. I'm on here with my good buddy Byron. Uh, Gary's not able to make it today. He's been so inspired by uh, following Stefan Kesting's journey on his canoe trip that he's decided to launch it of his own. And last I heard, a mule and a guide named Pappy, and he was heading up to the Yucatan. So we wish him the best of luck. Or he's headed to Yukon in Alaska. We wish him the best. Byron, yeah. how you doing? Wow. Yes, we try to try to follow him, but he really doesn't post anything as far as sharing anything like this story you're describing. But I'm doing great and happy to be here. Really excited uh, for this episode. Uh, we have Dave Brown joining us, and I I was sent this article that kind of covers Dave Brown by a couple of our listeners. It's on jujitsutimes.com, and the title of the article is He Started Jiu-Jitsu at 57 Years Old and 300 Pounds. He's now a 61-year-old athlete at the top of his game, and that's true. Like he, This guy, David, is fit as a fiddle. Uh, he, he's crushing it out there. He's, he's doing an amazing thing. So I think this is a story that you could, uh, you know, get inspired by. You could see some of your teammates. It could be you that like, hey, like, hey, are you 300 pounds starting jujitsu? That's okay. Uh, David did it, and here he is uh, sharing his story today. So I uh, really appreciate him uh, doing that today. And uh, I really love finding uh, stories like this and and you find somebody like like Dave who's who's well spoken and and really willing to just open up and share with with the community what he's been able to do and and I think it's very inspiring. So uh, thanks in advance, Dave Brown. <laughs> That'd be coming up shortly here. Yeah, I mean, how many times have we heard somebody at thirty seven wonder if they're too old to start jujitsu and here this guy started at fifty seven. So definitely an inspiration. I wonder if he had any help his first year, Byron. You think he had any resources? Uh, maybe he had a game. Uh, your first year at BGJ, would that have helped? Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, if he had anything, but I'm sure he had some help. You're, everybody needs a little help their first year. And, and most of the times you, you lean on your coach and your teammates and uh, maybe learn a little bit of one or two things from a podcast, something like that. Uh, also, another resource for your first year of training would be an audio book made by yours truly, uh, your first year at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's about two and a half hours long. It covers everything from finding the right gym for you all the way up to if you want to compete and enter a tournament. So it's kind of a wide range of topics that you'll uh, at least consider your first year of training. And I want to help you smooth out some of those rough spots and, and get through that. Because I really think if you could do a year of jiu-jitsu, uh, you've unlocked a enjoyable activity that you've gotten reasonably good at and that you'll be able to do for the long term. So get you past that first year, get you on the mats having a good time. Uh, the audio book is eleven ninety nine, and the money goes to help support the show. Uh, there's a link to it in the show notes, so check it out. Your first year of Jiu Jitsu audio book. Yep. Once you get past that first year, you're well on your way to a lifetime of Jiu Jitsu. So it's important to get that first year under your belt and uh, get off to a good start. That brings us to our off the mat lesson of the week. Um, Byron, you know I've been building a little bit of a skate park in my house, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I poured some cement ramps and uh, uh, had a little bit of a ch- round on it. It's going to be a lot of fun. But uh, one of the ramps I poured, I was in a little bit of a hurry, and I did, you know, was kind of slopping the cement in there, and I knew I was going to have to come back and clean it up when I was done. Figured I'd just hit it with a grinder. And man, it's a big ramp. Uh, so I got out there, started grinding on it. It's hot in Texas right now, humid can't work very long without taking a break and i went and i told my wife I said man this is gonna take me five days at this rate and i got to thinking i got looking at the grinder looking at the uh, grinder wheel and i thought man i'll bet this isn't the best wheel for this application so i ran into home depot dug through everything they had finally found something that was specifically geared for grinding cement and stone i went home and knocked out a couple and it just goes to show there's there's no substitute for having the right tool for the job I'm thinking about jiu-jitsu, and, and uh, I think it's a good idea to sort of specialize in some things, get good at one or two things. But um, if, if you're uh, grappling against somebody, you're training with somebody that just has really good choke defense, hides their neck really well, you could take that opportunity to work on choking somebody that's really good at defending it. 
or you could start to look for another tool or maybe they're exposing an arm at the way that with the way they're defending their neck maybe they're uh, uh letting up on their base a little bit you don't get a choke from the guard but you get a sweep so it's important when we're pulling to, to kind of realize that there's almost always a best technique for me in any given position and and if you find that technique just like the grinding deal it just became almost effortless you find the right technique to accomplish what you need to accomplish and then it just gets really easy yeah it, it, it reminds me of like the only tool you carry is a hammer everything looks like a nail <laughs> so finding the right tool like if, if the only thing you're thinking about and you get my back joe you're mostly thinking about applying to choke and I could I could defend that very very you know competitively and really make you work hard for that, but oftentimes the armbar is right there, and so yep. like yeah take make it easy on yourself, or you know, there's nothing wrong with re- developing that choke offense that could slice through a solid uh, you know a defense. So working that is it's not wrong, but it's sometimes if you're just wanting to uh, you know get that submission or, or work on you know just offense in general. The avenue yeah, I, of re- I, least resistance is very nice. Yeah, I think in jiu-jitsu, I, I think it's very valuable to to work on a choke against somebody that's got really good choke defense. But I think ultimately the, the goal is to get from a bad position to finishing the fight as efficiently as possible. And sometimes you have to practice that, and I think finding the right tool for the job comes in handy. No, knowing what what's your shortest route. If if you don't like being in your opponent's half guard, you'd rather be on their back. What's your shortest and, and quickest route to get there? What's the best tool? And uh, yeah, I just think it's a, it's a good concept to keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I didn't realize you were building quite a... Uh, you undertook quite the uh, the project there, Joe. I'll share videos. It's, it's, <laughs> it's going to be pretty extensive, so... <laughs> Having a good time. Now with you my can grandson. get hurt and banged up in your own <laughs> backyard. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to the skate park. <clears throat> but that's my experience with skateboarding. I just fall immediately. <laughs> but you seem to be doing uh, very well with it, and, and so is he. He's picking it up and having a great time. So that that's cool. Uh, got a, I guess it's a quote, kind of an old. It's an old fire uh, fighter saying. And it describes the fire service. It says, the fire service is 150 years of tradition, unimpeded by progress. And that's an, that's an old saying, and it's definitely not you know, like true, literally. But there are traditions that, that we have that really don't help out. There's not a lot of them. But, but, you know, I don't know how long ago, before my time, but... People were struggling to make changes because, you know, changes is not tradition. Traditionally, we've done this at the fire grounds. And, and now you wanted us to look at, you know, learn into to this new technique maybe or, or how to how to approach uh, attacking this fire. Well, we've always done it like this. So with 150 years of tradition, unimpeded by progress, even when there's a better way, uh, it, that saying doesn't hold true, but it, it does have some, uh, a hint of it's really hard to get people to to make a, a move even when it's for the better. And I think that you look at jiu-jitsu, you could say the, yeah, say the same thing, but I don't know, 150, you know, X amount of years. and some, But some traditions hold true that are uh, maybe questionable as far as is this right for the sport or right for my gym? And you could think about, I don't know. I, I hesitate to even say belt whipping because that's not even a tradition. That's a thing that was started not that long ago and, and kind of took off. And I think it's died back quite a bit getting whipped by belt when you get promoted but there are some things like not washing your belt would be a maybe a tradition uh that that <laughs> clearly you know moving forward having a into the future that's not gonna hold up it's it's a ridiculous tradition uh maybe some of the ways that we used to teach jujitsu as as far as just like learn by rolling all the time not that you know we just had an episode learn from rolling but the best way to learn is it's a hybrid of being shown things, discussing it, having some coaching, rolling, uh, failing, you know, improving, making some improvements, and then failing better next time. Uh, there's a lot of different things that, that I think will change with how we teach and share jiu-jitsu, and uh, we need to be open for that. You know, we've talked to people about technology and learning jiu-jitsu, and there's some cool things around the corner. Yeah, I really like that you kind of took that away from 
tradition, so to speak, towards the end and just got started talking about more like training practices and stuff. Uh, one, one thing that's always bothered me, I hear it in the workplace more in the gym, but is when people say, well, that's the way we've always done it. Like, that's a valid reason by itself to continue to do it that way if somebody's presenting you with a different idea that might be better. And uh, I think in, in any sport, you can get into that with your training methodology that we've been doing this for 20 years and it's been working. That doesn't mean that there might not be a better way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that doesn't mean don't try and improve it. Yeah, well, well said, Joe. Well, Joe, let's get on with our interview with Dave Brown. Here we go. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. His Facebook page has twice as many likes as the BJJ Brick Facebook page because everyone who likes the BJJ Brick Facebook page also likes his page. But then their moms go and like his page too. He can toe hold a duck. The first time he took his opponent's back, he never returned it. It now sits on his mantle in a jar of formaldehyde. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Go for the submission, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm excited to bring Dave Brown to the BJJ Brick podcast. Dave, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. I was first pointed towards you by a couple of our listeners who uh, read an article on Jiu-Jitsu Times dot uh, com, and and it, it the, the article simply states that you started at fifty seven years old at three hundred pounds, and and now you're sixty one, and you're you're one of the top athletes in, in your division. So uh, that is a uh, is kind of a short story of who you are. But tell us a little bit more. Uh, who who are you? What you're up to? Uh, well, I, uh, like I said, I started at 57. I, uh, years ago, <clears throat> many years ago, um, uh, as a young person, I wrestled. So <clears throat> I was, uh, jujitsu was definitely something that I, you know, would enjoy. I realized right away, I went to a, um, uh, my first introduction to uh, jujitsu, I went to a Naga tournament that my son was in. It was his first tournament. He'd just taken up, uh, BJJ like six months earlier, and he called me up one morning and said, hey, Dad, I'm going to be at this tournament. You want to come watch? And, you know, absolutely. And um, so I go to the tournament, and uh, there's a couple of guys there um, that look like they were maybe mid to early to mid-40s or something like that. But, yeah. but clearly, you know, it had adults. It wasn't just for the young people. There were some guys there. And, uh, I mean, immediately, as soon as I saw his first match, I knew I would love it. And, uh <clears throat> literally it was all I could think about for three days was, uh, was, uh, where can I sign up? And I, you know, did a little Google search and I, uh, finally called, uh, you know, the place that I was interested in and talked to the professor and anyway, signed up and, um, you know, we went from there. I, I was, my biggest thing was, am I just kidding myself? Am I too old? Uh, you know, at the time I was 57 and I thought, you know, <clears throat> this is probably just, there's just no way. You know, I really didn't. I really didn't believe it was possible. But I thought, i got to give it a try. If I don't try it, I know I'm going to regret that. So uh, anyway, so I did. And, uh, um, you know, it took a while. It took, uh, it took uh, probably a couple of weeks, I'd say, maybe two weeks before I could get through an entire class without sitting out, you know. I was, that, I was so out of shape. But uh, eventually I got to where I could get through an hour class, and then, you know, next thing you knew, I was doing th- two or three a week, and pretty soon now I can do, you know, five, six a week wouldn't be a problem at all. <laughs> well, that, that's awesome. Uh, how important do you think it was, looking back, that there were uh, in, not just kids and some adults, like in their 20s and 30s, but that there were a few guys that were a little bit older that you're like, well, these guys are doing it. Was that was that pretty fundamentally thinking in getting you on the idea that, that this could maybe be for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I looked around, and most you know most of the people in the tournament were in their twenties and thirties, and of course they had you know kids too. Um, but at the time when I was there, they were running the adults. Uh, but there were a couple of guys, and you know, I asked, "Is there an age limit?" No, no, no age limit. Uh, well, you know, hey, if they can do it. Uh, I'm going to give it a try. And, I, you know, I was fair, you know, another 10, 15 years older than those guys. But I thought, well, you know, I'm not, not, 
I don't think it was uh, out of the range of possibility. Let's put it that way. I really didn't think it would be that I could do it, but I thought, well, there's a there's a possibility. So, yeah, that you know that made a difference. Yeah. I was glad to see that there was a sport that it involved that where older people could participate if they, you know, if they wanted to and felt up to it and so on. How much did your wrestling background uh, come back to you? Well, you know, at first I thought, well, there, this isn't going to help at all. It was 36 years earlier that I had wrestled. And I thought, well, there's no way this is going to do me any benefit. Um, because I'd forgotten everything. I, 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 I Literally, I hadn't done it in so long that I, I couldn't remember anything. But you know what it's like? It's like a foreign language. If you, if you say you were fluent in a foreign language and then haven't used it for a long, long time, um, yeah, you forget a lot and so on, but you start using it and it comes back so quick. It, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, the brain controls uh, our language. The brain also controls our motor skills. And it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. So um, my wrestling uh, background, I think, really did help a lot. Still does. I still do things. Sometimes I do things just by reaction and it works out beautifully. I think, God, I don't remember doing that, but... Uh, um, where'd that come from, you know? Yeah. So how, just to dive a little deeper into that, how much did you wrestle? I mean, how, how that, how'd your wrestling career go? Well, I, I wrestled, uh, through college. Okay. So yeah, I, I wrestled in high school and I started, actually started in junior high and then, uh, wrestled through high school and then on, uh, through college, I wrestled, uh, for Purdue. Wow. Uh, so you're a pretty serious wrestler, but uh, definitely uh, had, there was that time gap in between, uh, you know, your wrestling and your jiu-jitsu. And, and I'm not surprised that it came back to you. I, It seems like when I roll with somebody who's just starting jiu-jitsu, I could usually guess whether they've wrestled or not. And uh, I'm sure your your teammates felt the same. Like, oh, this guy's probably wrestled before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a little while, but it you know stuff started coming back uh, you know pretty quick. I mean things that uh, and and you know like I hadn't done a double leg in in thirty six years. You know I like I go to Pan Am's and you know right off the bat I take the guy down with a double leg and we hadn't even practiced it. Um, we had practiced other takedowns, but uh, you know it was just natural for me nice. to just do a double leg takedown. So you, you mentioned that it was hard for you to get through just a full practice. It took you a while to get to that point. How Describe to us a little bit, how out of shape were you? Were you doing anything physically before you decided to hop on the mats, or did you get in shape before that? Uh, no, actually for 36 years I sat in front of a computer all day. Uh, you know, I have a desk job. I'm an engineer, structural engineer, and uh, really hadn't, hadn't been real active since, uh, since college. Um, and yeah, I was way out of shape. I mean, I was at the point where if I go up a flight of stairs, I'd, you know, be breathing hard. So, so I definitely needed to do something. And my doctor told me I needed to do something. He said that, uh, you know, based on my lab results and everything, he it said, uh, I had type two diabetes, high blood pressure. He said, man, you got to do a real lifestyle change and you got to do it right now. He said, hey, the party's over. And, uh, man, thank God jujitsu came along because, it really it changed my life. Everything got better. All my, you know, blood tests came back. Uh, my A1C, which is the, um, is what they look at for uh, diabetes, came back not only normal but in the mid range of of normal. Um, high, my blood pressure went down. All the numbers got better, like almost immediately. So much so that he sent me to a cardiologist. He said, "Man, when we get that big a change in your heart," <laughs> he said, "I know it's all good." He said, "I know everything's gotten better," but he said, "Anytime we get a, a big change, we got to send you to a cardiologist." He said, "I'm, you know, like ninety nine or ninety percent sure that it's it's all good and that it, what it's from it's from your exercise routine." But I just want to confirm that. And so, you know, he sent me to cardiologist. He said, oh, yeah. I said, that's, you know, you've done exactly what we tell our patients to do. Your, my pulse rate went way down, went down to the uh, upper 40s, where I think before it was like 70 or something. Wow. Which even 70 wasn't too bad. Um, but when it got down that low, my doctor got kind of concerned. He thought, man, there's something, is, is something wrong here? <laughs> uh, 
And the cardiologist said, no, absolutely. He said, if you, uh, you've been working out like that, then, yeah, your, your heart rate will come down. Dave, was there any concern at the beginning of, of getting into jiu-jitsu that you might overdo it? And, you know, like your, your doctors mentioned, you had a, a risk of having a stroke or heart attack. W- were, you, were you not getting through the whole classes because you were tired, or were you saying, I need better back off a little bit, I need to be, be safe with, with what I have? No, it was just because I was tired. Okay. I just, in fact, I even asked my doctor that. Now, I didn't tell him right off the bat I was in jiu-jitsu. I, I, I started jiu-jitsu. I go see the doctor every six months. And I want to say within like two months, I went to see him. You know, the, the next, my next appointment was like two months later. So I hadn't really lost a whole lot of weight. I had been working out, but, uh, you know, only two months. And I asked him, I said, can you work out too much? He said, no. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so, all right, all right. I didn't tell him what it was. I just said, can you work out too much? I was a little concerned about that, but, man, he said that. I said, hey, you know, um, the thing is your body um, will uh, temper things. You know, when you're too tired, you're going to sit out, and uh, that's what I did. Wow. I, Dave, I, I know a lot of uh, guys, uh, like I guess between our age rates, I'm, I'm basically, I turned 40 here in a little bit, and – that, that that do not go to the doctor. Uh, a lot of guys just they, they go ten, fifteen, twenty years without seeing a, a physician. Uh, is that what, were you in that boat and you went in and and he was like, dude, you got to get your health under control, or were you going, you know, every year or so and and just kind of uh, sailing along like that? No, I was definitely in that boat. I didn't go hardly at all. My wife used to get on me all the time about going to the doctor, and. Uh, Anyway, our uh, insurance changed, and I had to change doctors anyway, so I can't remember. It was like uh, it was probably a couple years before I uh, uh, started uh, BJJ, and uh, um, I went to this doctor, and uh, and he told me, he said, "Man, you got to do something." Uh, he said, I, "You know, in the shape I was in," and he said, "I want to see you every six months." And I finally decided, you know what, I'm just going to do that. And uh, so anyway, since then, I've been going to see him every six months. Um, and, you know, not much changed, a little bit, not much until jujitsu, And then everything changed. I, I hear a lot about the difference between, um, you know, great workouts and also uh, a, a much better diet. How much has your diet totally changed or is most of this based on you just get on the mats and, and just working really hard? Well, at, at first, all I did was jiu-jitsu, I, I was the, and I started to lose some weight. Um, and then, of course, the professor and others, you, you know, talk about good diet and so on. So I thought, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm glad I'm losing weight. Let me, let's see about encouraging this by trying to eat a little bit better because my professor's really big on uh, nutrition and eating right. And uh, so I kind of looked into it and. Um, Anyway, I did change my diet. Uh, the biggest thing was I cut out sugar to the extent possible. Uh, I had no idea how much sugar there was in all these products. Milk, I didn't know milk had that much sugar in it. Um, just all kinds of things. When you start reading labels, it's shocking. So that was the biggest thing is I cut out as much sugar from my diet as I could. And then I try to keep the carbs down. I'm not on any special diet. I don't count calories or points or you know, Nutrisystem, I got all these things. I don't do any of that. Um, uh, just eat reasonable amounts and try to eat healthy food. And it makes a huge difference. It really does. Because when I started doing that, then it really started coming off. Between the exercise and the eating right, it really made a difference. And I feel a whole lot better. What was it like your first couple of uh classes like like you go in there were there any guys about your age or was it, are you a room full of young young men or or young men and women what, were, what was that that first uh few stages like uh, mostly they're young guys you know uh we got a, some young gals um but mostly you know guys in their 20s and 30s um there was one guy um he still comes he, he usually goes to a uh, earlier class than I do, but uh, that was actually a couple years older than me. Uh, everyone else was younger. There were some, uh, there's, you know, a couple that were around in their 40s, you know, but uh, mostly they were, you know, younger guys. 
how how did the uh, idea that you wanted to go compete? Did that something you brought you brought in when you walked in the door? Like, my, I, I saw my son compete at Naga. I want to start competing in jujitsu, or did you just want to try jujitsu and it was introduced some other way? I wanted to compete the second I saw the match. My first match, that was all I wanted to do. I, I had no interest in, in practice or any, you know, I wanted to compete. I mean, that was from day one, uh, immediately. It was, you know, I hadn't competed on a mat in 36 years, and the idea that I would do that again was just, it was just this overwhelming desire. And so, um, so from, you know, the second I saw it, that was the goal. And that's what I told my professor. And I said, I want to compete. Um, you know, even if it's, if I can only just compete for a couple of tournaments, I'll be happy. Just, I, I just want to compete. And so the deal we cut was, he said, well, you sign up here for a year. And uh, he said, I'll, we'll make you a competitor. And that was in March of 2016. And it just so happens, you know, Pan Ams is in March. So they were like going on at the time, or I think they had just finished up. And he said, we'll just make it a goal that you'll be, uh, you'll compete at Pan Ams in 2017. And that was my, my first big tournament. I did do, a, I think, a local one prior to that. But, uh, but anyway, that was the goal. And um, yeah, that's about what it took. It took about a year to get in shape and, and in a condition where I could you know, compete. But from you know, day one, that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's, that's uh, maybe a big uh, driving factor as far as is getting you to train really hard and, and that sort of thing. Were you doing, or do you do much off-the-mat training? Um, I'll do weightlifting and running, those two. And, and how, so, what's the, are you running when you can't go do jiu-jitsu, or do you, do you kind of mix them together, or, or when do you do those other activities? I try, to get, I try to get some cardio in every day, and if that, you know, if I can... Uh, if I do sparring, a lot of times in some of these classes will spar for half an hour or so, then that's fine. I got my cardio in. Um, otherwise, I try to do, you know, I try to run. So you, you obviously, you, you started out, by the time you competed, were you a blue belt or a white belt? A blue belt. Got my blue belt at Pan Am's that morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I just got blue. Yeah, it, uh, so I, I basically I had, I had gone for one year, and uh, at IBJJF, um, I think it's after, it's either after Masters 2 or 3, uh, they only have blue belt. There is no white belt at, at Masters. I can't remember if it's 3 okay. and up or 4 and up. And so um, if you're going to be a white belt, I, you got to, you know, drop down all the way to like Masters Two, I think it is, and so um, so anyway, um, for me to compete at IBJJF uh, with guys anywhere close to my age, you know, I'd have to be a blue belt. So that was the goal, and uh, you know, that's what happened. And then you, you're now a purple belt. What's what, when did that happen? That happened uh, what? Uh, let's see, two months ago, I think. Yeah, I think two months ago. Okay. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's about right. Was it March? Wait a minute. I was Pan, well, before Pan Ams again. Okay. So yeah, then I was a blue belt for two years, and then uh, and then Pan Ams in 2019 because I, I did Pan Ams in 2017 and 18 as a blue belt, and then the week of Pan Ams this last time, which was tw- March of 2019. Uh, earlier that week, I got my purple belt, and then on um, at the end of the week, I. Um, you know, participated in uh, Pan Am's 2019. Uh, Dave, I forgot to ask you, uh, where are you training at, and and who's your who's your coach? I train at Halcyon Jiu Jitsu, which is uh, in Spring, Texas, and uh, the coach is uh, Matt Smith. All right, and you started this watching your your son doing Naga. Does your son still train? Yes. Uh huh. Do you get much mat time with him? Is he is he live near you or? He lives a little ways away, um, but there's a gy- the gym he goes to is kind of uh, uh, right in between the two, you know, where we both uh, live. And so usually what we'll do is uh, we'll meet up there uh, on Sundays for open mat. That that's, uh, sounds like a good way to to continue having a uh, a good relationship with your son. As he enters into adulthood, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, as, yeah, it really worked out beautifully. That, and that was, of course, another you know, one of the main reasons I wanted to get involved. I thought, well, Dan, it'd be something Dan and I can do together. And, um, you know, I, I really thought that uh, that was his first competition. And uh, that's his only competition. I don't know. He, after that, he didn't really care to compete. I really was surprised. I, I thought that he would want to uh, to compete, too. But as it turns out, I ended up being the one that wanted to compete so much. And um, he'll come watch me. And, of course, we do open mat together and, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, but uh, yeah, he, doesn't, he just doesn't care to compete. Dave, what does your, your game look like if it's going well? If, if you're executing things that you want to do, um, what's that? Are, are you getting takedowns? Are you are you working from the top, or, or what's going on? Yeah, definitely a takedown. I'll I'll uh, I'll go for the takedowns, and uh, a lot of times guys pull guard on me. They know I'm a wrestler. They know I'm going to do takedowns, so they you know they pull guard. But uh, uh, if I can take them down before they pull guard, then uh, you know that that would be my goal. Um, and then once on top, uh, you know, just try to improve my position, get the mount and. Uh, and a submission, usually with an um, an arm bar, an Americana, a Kimura, something like that. That's that's usually what I'll go for. But uh, oh, every now you know, I'll get some chokes. I've done you know certain chokes and so on. But that's that's primarily you know my game. I, I like to be on top. I you tend to do better on top. Are you pretty much exclusively gi, or do you do much no gi? I do no gi. Yeah, usually the uh, at the bigger tournaments uh, we'll do no gi. Um, I don't do as much, but um, but I'll, I'll do no gi. Which which do you you trade more gi or is it pretty much a mix? Um, mostly gi. We we have one class a week that is no gi. If you if you had a friend in a similar situation. Um, you know, mid to late fifties who wanted to start jiu-jitsu and let's just say they, they didn't even, they didn't have that wrestling background. They were just wanting to get in better shape. Uh, what kind of advice would you give them to, to get a good start at jiu-jitsu? Well, I'd say, uh, definitely give it a try. Um, I mean, go into it with an open mind, uh, give it a try. Um, you know, don't feel like you have to, you know, push yourself real hard, you know, right off the bat. Uh, nobody cares. I, you know, I was one thing. I was, I thought, man, I'm going to go in there. It's, I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to look terrible. Yeah, you know, nobody cares. That's the point. Nobody cares. It, uh, they're just happy you're there. Uh, they'll be very supportive. They'll help you. Um, if you need to sit out, sit out. You know, uh, it's no big deal. Um, but just hang in there. Don't don't give up. You know, that first after that first uh, session, you'll wake up the next morning, may have a hard time getting out of bed. You'll be so sore, but. Uh, um, you know, give give it a couple of days. Let your body uh, let that soreness out, and then just keep going, and uh, it'll get better. And uh, you'd be amazed at how how much a difference it can make. Yeah, I think we've. If you enjoy jujitsu, I think we've found kind of a a cheat to staying fit. As in, you don't have to drag yourself to somewhere to exercise that you dislike. It's. It's rather fun. The, the activity of it usually you're surrounded by friends as you as you're training because you get close with with uh, with the people on the mats and it's just it's kind of a. I feel like I I don't have to go work out. I just go do jujitsu and I happen to get a good workout when I do that. Uh, I, I can't always motivate myself to go work out. <laughs> but I can always Absolutely. I'm always happy to go train jujitsu. Yeah. Yeah, going to the gym, just the standard gym to weight lift or run on the treadmill. To me, it's just drudgery, you know. Uh, but now I can go to, I can even go to the gym and weight lift, and it's more fun because I'm doing it for a purpose. Yeah, that makes I'm sense. doing it to be a better competitor. And so now that I've got that goal out there, um, all of a sudden, it, you know, it's not so much of a drudgery. Yeah, that that makes. Th- that makes sense to me. Uh, you, you mentioned about you know not wanting to go and and to get embarrassed. And we've we've talked about on the show before. This this rule is called twenty, forty, and sixty rule. When you're twenty, you care what people think about you, and you try to you know make that happen. And when you're forty, you don't care what they think about you. And when you're sixty, you realize nobody thinks about you; they think about themselves. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> So there's really no reason to be nervous about what people are thinking about you when you start jujitsu or when you're in the gym working out. If you're lifting not enough weights or if you're 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 running slow or whatever, nobody's worried about you. They're worried about what they're doing, and uh, yeah, that's that's something that 
I think the sooner you realize that, the easier things get for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing, you know, advice for somebody who has never grappled. So switch it. Like if you were to give yourself advice when you when you started, um, what would what would have been the advice to get you? Uh, I, I guess you had a great start anyway. But if you could give yourself advice back when you were just starting, just what would it have been? Oh, I say uh, take it slow, tap early. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about tapping out. Tap early, or real early. Don't you know? No sense in um, you know letting something go a little further than you should have. Um, you know, mainly just take it easy, especially at the at the beginning. Get yourself in shape and and slowly uh, add more sessions or a little bit longer time or throw in some weightlifting and so on. I, I tend to push myself a little hard uh, too fast, and uh, that would have been that probably would have been a really good advice back then. It was just you know try to go a little bit slower and work up to it. Yeah, I like the, the tapping early. A lot of times, you it's just it's perfectly fine to tap to the uh, position of that submission. So once, like for me, I, I still tap earlier on Kimuras. So if you get a Kimura on me and your hands, both your hands have good grips, I, I'm usually happy to tap right there. Or if my, yeah, like it's okay to tap to an arm bar where your arm is still bent. The position of the arm bar is good. You, you can't really escape this. It's fine to tap and not have to have your elbow hyperextended. Mm-hmm. So the, yeah, that's, Tap early is is great advice for anybody. Start. Have you ever had uh, an injury yet in jujitsu? I tore my MCL was the was the uh, the biggest one. Oh, recently I had a little uh, oh, torn uh, tendon in my finger, and it's it's getting better. Um, it's a whole lot better now. Um, but my MCL that put me out for uh, oh man that put me out for several months in that first year, and it it was. Uh, I just couldn't do anything. I, I'd go to class and just uh, watch uh, for like several, let's see, like, almost four months. It was, uh, and it was just, you know, nobody had done anything wrong. We, I was just uh, uh, sparring, and I just uh, planted my foot and pushed off of it really hard like uh, uh, bridging. And, uh, man, it just popped, you know, and it tore. So it can happen, and uh, I now watch it. Right, I've gotten better at uh, knowing uh, what not to do, and and you know, watching certain things like that knee. I don't. Uh, there's certain things I just I won't twist it certain ways. Yeah, and I haven't been hurt, I haven't been hurt since. That that that's good. It's <laughs> that, that's an important thing as well to 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 protect yourself, and you know, you're you're now in in great shape. And I urge everybody to go look at the the pictures in the article, uh, the transformation you've had, just life altering changes. But you also don't want to uh, damage your body in the process. I mean, so so being able to protect yourself on the mass is, is also very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. You you mentioned you're an engineer. Have you seen any? Have you learned anything in your career that you've brought to jiu-jitsu, maybe a different angle or a different thought than most, or maybe vice versa? Have you learned something on jiu-jitsu that you've taken to work? Huh. Well, you know, um, as a structural engineer, uh, we're uh, concerned about forces and what they call moments and things like that. Yeah, and that actually applies in jiu-jitsu. Uh, pressure points and, and how you... Uh, um, you know, I, hard to explain here uh it, it actually does come into play somewhat yeah seeing how um how you can uh, best uh use pressure and um in a way to uh overcome uh, certain holds and so on it actually does it, it's and, and there was a there was a professor at uh who is he with mavens i think and he put on a little seminar he was a uh he was a math teacher and he was uh he gave some really good examples of uh jujitsu and geometry and how to use that and I thought it was fascinating because it, it was really true you know about uh oh just the, the the fundamentals of sweeps and certain things and how we use uh geometry and if you can if you can see the geometry you can see why we tilt a certain way and why we need to pull a guy, you know, a certain way. Um, 
and it really is true. It it uh, it's all physics. It really is. So, um, in some ways, yeah, I think it it I can see some of it. Yeah, like having a better understanding of physics than the average person would definitely help you understand why uh, you're able to off balance somebody or uh, why you're able to keep your balance in a situation. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's, that, I'm always interested in, in people uh, being able to take something from jiu-jitsu and apply it to the other part of their life or vice versa. So that's that's pretty neat. Do you, what are your goals for the, the next uh, little while or so? Well, my biggest goal uh, coming up would be World Masters, and I definitely want to uh, get double gold. That would be my uh, my immediate goal. And that's what I'm working towards. Um, I have at least one tournament between now and then. I've got one in Austin coming up in, I think, two weeks. Um, I may do another one. Um, There's several that are coming up uh, before World Masters. World Masters is in August, and I'll get to It's in Las Vegas. I'm going to get there about a week uh, ahead of time. And there's a camp at uh, Alliance in uh, Las Vegas uh, with Lucas Lepre, um, and um, like two a day sessions for the week uh, ahead of World Masters. So anyway, I'm going to attend that. So I should be in uh, should be in pretty good shape uh, for World Masters. That's great. Um, so when do you uh, knowing your body and, and your training schedule? It, that tournament has a has a date on it. Um, do you, do you just train the same all the time, or do you, like the month up ahead you're you're starting to alter your game plan a little bit, or you know the last couple of weeks you're doing things differently? Well, I try to do at least one tournament a month, and um, sometimes two. So really, I just about have to just train the same, you know, all the okay. time. So you're competing all now, the time. <laughs> yeah, and the week before the tournament, no weightlifting. So I don't do any weightlifting for at least you know, seven days prior to an event, but I'll still do full sparring and so on. Now the, the day before I won't do anything, I'll I'll take that day off. Um, and, and the day before that, so two days before, uh, it'll be light. I won't do anything, you know, no, nothing hard, uh, no, you know, hard sparring or anything like that. Um, and that's about the only change that I really make is the few days before a tournament, I alter it a little bit. Otherwise, I have to just keep going because yeah. you know, I've always got the next tournament after that. I yeah. don't take yeah. A, yeah, it's not like I take you know several months off or anything like that. I just keep going. I'm trying to get in as many tournaments as I can while I can. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I know that yeah, there's no way I, you can do this. You know, for me, my years are numbered. I can only do it for so many more years. I don't know what that number is, um, but you know, at 61, um, I you know I, I know it's I, I don't have the years that say these 20 and 30 year olds have so do you think you'll you'll continue to train even if you if you're not competing i think so i think so i think i could probably help uh you know with the classes help teach or or, you know uh, still be involved um but for now i'm going to compete and uh, i'm glad i can and i'm you know that's all i'm thinking about right now i I look at the different uh cycles in in people's lives You, you know from from the school age and doing jiu-jitsu and, and being a student and trying to train and then being some people, you know, being a parent and trying to train and trying to balance those lifestyles. And then uh, do you think this is a a good time in your life to be able you, – you, you compete a lot. <laughs> and I think a lot of people with, with young children at home or just developing careers, it's hard for them to find that much time to compete. Is it an advantage as far as with your schedule and kind of your off-the-mat life? You know, does it help you with jiu-jitsu being where you are now? Absolutely. Yeah, we're empty nesters. All of our kids are grown and and they've all got jobs and you know, one of them is married. Um so, you know, we've got a lot more time on our hands. The other thing is I um I'm a business owner and my uh so my my uh, the business pretty well runs itself. It uh I've got a great group of guys here that uh can handle it. So that that frees me up. Um you know, I can uh, take a lot of time off and off from work, and um, so it, it's really helped a lot. I, just, I guess my what I'm saying is my time is much more flexible 
than back when uh, you know we had small children and so on. It's just a lot, lot tougher to to work uh, jujitsu into your schedule with all the things that a family you know has going on. So that yeah, that has definitely been a big help. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I mean, if I'm just thinking, if, if somebody's you know in their their 30s or 40s and and they're just so busy, they could train a little bit, but they have no time to compete. Hang in there, and, and maybe uh, you know, as, as things continue to grow and develop, you'll you'll get some more free time, and you could go out there and and compete like you want to. And, and I think you're a great inspiration for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it it makes a big difference. Uh, Dave, if somebody wants to uh, get a hold of you, ask you a question, or or just to just to tell you thanks for for who you are, uh, would be a good place to do that. Uh, well, they could uh, message me on um, on Facebook. I am on Facebook. Um, it'd be just David E. I think it's David E. Brown, um, Spring, Texas. Okay, I'll put a, I'll link to that in the in the show notes so people could find it easily. And I definitely encourage them to check out the article on Just Two Times. I'll have a link to that as well. Any okay. any final advice or thoughts you want to share with the audience? Uh, just hang in there. You know, give, give Jiu Jitsu a try. For those of you on the fence thinking about it or whatever, uh, give it a try. Give it your best efforts, uh, and then just hang in there and uh, keep at it. Um, you know, it, get, it does get better and better. It really does. It, you know, at first, especially for us older guys, it, it, it can be a little overwhelming, but, uh, uh, you know, take it easy and uh, hang in there. Yeah, that, that's awesome, and uh, uh, give it a try. And that's kind of, if, if you enjoy it, Great. If it's if you could give it a try, it is totally not for you. <laughs> well, you tried it, and, and keep trying for something else that you also enjoy and, and counts as a as a fitness activity. You know, I, whether that's I don't know dancing or I, some other class like that. But find something that's fun that also is a workout. And uh, I think we're lucky to have Jutsu for that. Yeah, absolutely. David, uh, I uh, really enjoyed you being on the show today. Um, looking forward to watching you uh, continue on to compete and, and to train and get better and better. Thank you so much for being on here with me. All right. Well, thank you, Byron. And it was great to have uh, Dave on the show and, and share some of his story. And, y- you know, Dave, he comes with a strong wrestling background, and that definitely helped him transition to uh, doing well on the competitive mats. But it really doesn't matter. Yeah, he's he's. I, I promise you, he's burning more calories training than he is competing. Although he competes all the time, he's competing like once a month. That's a, that's crazy. But he he's the reason why he's fit is he's training hard, and and I guess the fuel for that is he wants to compete well. But if, if he would go out there and not do well, but continue to train hard and, and to do and do. All things he's doing, he's still gonna be a super fit guy. Like his body doesn't realize if he's winning all these tournaments. He's got tremendous health benefits. So if if you don't have that tremendous wrestling base, you're thinking about jiu-jitsu, it it might be a little bit of a tougher start, but that doesn't matter. It's it's still gonna be an enjoyable process. You're still gonna get better. There's leaps and bounds of, of betterness that you could get uh, in even a short amount of time. Uh, it, it, you know, you could experience that, and it, and it really feels good and. The health benefits for a lot of us are like a secondary benefit. I get to go hang out with my friends for an hour and a half, and as a side note, I get a really good workout. I would go to jiu-jitsu if it didn't even count as working out. If it was, if it was, if I didn't even break a sweat. Not that it, I, I, it, the two don't match, but if it didn't count for a workout, if I had to use I don't know somebody else's body and and they got the workout instead, I would still go. It's still a very fun, enjoyable activity. So. The, the the key is in your training and and it whether you're having the the awesome success Dave's having or not you're still doing great things uh, for your own health which is a big win in the long run. Yeah, so set set a guy like Dave out there way out as a long term ideal, but don't start jujitsu and and expect to have the same results as anybody else, and and don't be discouraged if yours are slower or yours are different. Uh, 57 is not too old to start jujitsu, whether you're going to be a competitor like Dave or you're just going to go to the gym a couple times a week and train with your friends. Just get on the mats. Yep. We've got a question in here, and she wants to know about uh, recommendations for somebody who's got a little over a year of training. And she wants to know, what should she be working on? Okay, that's a very broad question as far as 
if you don't know the person and if you, you have any spent mad time, whatever, like a question over a pocket, what should somebody with a year of training be working on? But I do feel that there are some areas we could help guide here. Uh, do you have any ideas about this one, Joe? Well, I think at a year, there's a couple things you should be starting to do that you weren't doing at six months. One of those would be to start to understand how uh, different positions and different techniques kind of fit together. Um, you know, have some transitions that go from st- sweep straight into a, a pass or sweep straight into a submission. Um, you know, develop a little series like you from close guard for a Kimura, and if they defend that, you go for the sweep. If they drive back in, you you go for a guillotine. Just, just little things like that that fit together, I think, is uh, one of the things you want to start looking at. Yeah, that that's great, and it, it is easier to land a, a, a combination of things because if, if Joe attacks with an arm bar, I defend that. If Joe's anticipating my defense, which there's only so many ways that I'm likely to defend it, and he has an answer for my next thing, he could often find himself a step ahead of me. And it's not like he's learning a million techniques. He might, let's just say he's, he does armbar and a triangle. Well, he's just combined these. So when I pull my arm out, he starts attacking that triangle. Boom, he's, he's, he's doubled <laughs> his attack. And when I pull my arm out like that, I'm in a, I'm in a bad spot. And, and I re- reacted in a way that, that Joe predicted, and he's, he's a step ahead of me at that point. I think another thing you could think about at that kind of that year mark is what things are you kind of naturally getting good at. You know, we all have, by that time, a couple of favorite submissions, maybe a sweep or that you really enjoy or a takedown, and start to work on making that even better. You know, start working on picking on those blue belts if you can and, and, and working up your... Uh, working up that chain and or that ladder, and and uh, and making making your basic attacks that that you're good at even better, uh, like building bricks. You know, building something that is going to be one of your more reliable techniques. And you know, if we could, you could quite easily be at that year mark, and and you're kind of have that wide range of of things you've you've looked at over the course of the year. Uh, but I do think it's about time to start. Uh, narrowing down your focus uh, during your training, during your off-the-mat learning, during your actual rolling, what you're trying to pull off. That's a good time to start doing that if you're not already. I want to give a quick shout-out to our newest Patreon supporter, Joseph. He signed up uh, a little bit ago in July. I uh, really appreciate Joe uh, for supporting us it, on Patreon. And uh, what, what Joe's done is – or Joseph, I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> 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 we got a Joe right here. <laughs> but uh, w- what Joseph has done is he's, he's heard the podcast. He's, like, he's thought, boy, I'd like to help these guys out and make this show uh, as good as it could possibly be and support them and, and, and help them do uh, what they're doing with, with the podcast. So there's a link in the show notes or on the website for Patreon. Click on that link just like Joseph did. It takes you uh, to a little description about uh, our Patreon stuff. But... Uh, I'll mail out a five-inch BJJ brick gi patch. Wait a minute, two of those. <laughs> Forget about that. I need to change my little notes here. It says gi- a gi patch. <laughs> I still have some of the old uh, throwback gi patches, and the, and the new gi patches are uh, amazing uh, with the level of detail and, and the stitch work on those. Those are going to look good on any gi. Uh, but okay, so I mailed out two uh, free or as a token of appreciation. Uh, gi patches and i'll throw a sticker in there and uh, joseph i haven't seen you join our private facebook group yet but recording this a little bit ahead of time so uh if you haven't joined the pri- private facebook group send me a message on facebook i'm the only byron jabara on facebook <laughs> b-y-r-o-n j-a-b-a-r-a <laughs> i don't know uh, that's a pretty easy way to, to find kind of uh Kind of click into that, and I'll get you invited to the f- private Facebook group if you're a Patreon supporter. We'd love to have you there. We do a lot of behind-the-scenes trash talking to Gary, and uh, that's always fun. Man, I do – so <laughs> a couple of things, a little housekeeping, I guess. Uh, and, and, Joe, I don't – I haven't even – I haven't told you this. Last Monday, we had to actually skip that episode because uh, it just didn't work out with scheduling anybody, and I wasn't able to record an episode on my own. I, that's very difficult, and, and I didn't have the uh, – the time to even set that up and, and do that. I was fairly busy. So we missed last Monday. So here we're back. 
And Gary is still unavailable this week. And uh, anyway, <laughs> Gary's okay. He's we we pick on each other a lot. He's not mad at us. <laughs> I've known Gary since 2002. We're good buddies. Uh, you know, you get a few people worried about. Hey, what's happening back there? No, we're all good. Uh, it's just just like I don't know, Joe. I was thinking. It, sometimes some weeks it is super easy and and really fun to get out of podcast and and I always enjoy recording, but some weeks I am scrambling to piece together the elements of a podcast and is affecting like a lot of my I would say off the mat stuff, but my non podcasting life is you know thrown up and and cause a bit of chaos and I've got other things in my life that I'm trying to juggle as well. So I was like, you know what, on Monday last week. We'll just have to skip that one, and that's going to have to not be a big deal. And and I think that occasionally doing that makes life a lot easier for podcasters. Uh, we haven't done that in the past, but uh, it's just it's just I think something I don't want to do very often. I don't like you know. Obviously, we'd like to be really reliable for you guys and, and bring a show every week, but uh, it's just been uh, been a tough you know week and a half or so for the for the podcast as far as off the air off the podcast i keep wanting to say off the mat but uh we're getting that piece back together i do go on vacation in a little bit here we're hoping to get a few episodes stacked up before i leave hopefully we won't have to skip anything but uh if we do i think it's just easier for long-term podcasting if i'm not trying to try and like and stressing out other parts of my life and keeping everybody uh you know keeping keeping my off the air life uh good as well so <laughs> that's what happened <laughs> i didn't even tell you joe uh we had to miss uh, we're missing uh last week as far as uh, putting an episode out just because it is just too tricky to get there, all the things figured out and that's i don't know i think that's okay yeah, i i knew i was unavailable i didn't know gary was also so yeah uh, that's okay i mean like <laughs> it should be it, it shouldn't be a point where like you're scrambling to make it work and it's stressful. Like if we keep this enjoyable, just like jujitsu, we'll be able to do this a lot longer. If we start stressing about, hey, we really can't miss this week, and 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 really, you know, making it uh, a pressure thing, I think that it's- yeah. So, you ever read any of Stephen Covey's books? The Seven Habits of Highly yeah. uh, Average People. <laughs> no. have you read that one i i can't remember i read so many books i probably yeah. have that's it yeah I, I read it one of the things he talked about in there was uh um getting too busy putting out little fires okay and sometimes and sometimes you and then a new one starting a new one starting and, and you're always three three behind and sometimes you just got to step away from a couple of them and let them burn themselves out and you know you, you, can, you just can't keep doing that, and I think that's applicable to what you're saying, man. Yeah. If you're if you're chasing yourself and you're killing yourself trying to get a podcast out, then the next one's difficult and take a. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a good way to I I forgot about that, <laughs> but now, but that's basically what's happening. I'm trying to get uh, to where we have uh, uh, th- we're, or actually it'd be nice to be three podcasts up. So when I I, I do go on uh, this trip with my wife. Uh, they all auto publish and and everything is run smoothly. But I needed some time to get that kind of I guess the behind the scenes uh, stuff organized because I don't know it, 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 this may not be interesting to people. So was <laughs> we like to be super reliable? Uh, and we'll try in the in the future, but occasionally. And and like last episode, I did say, hey guys, just a quick note here, uh, we're gonna miss an episode next week. So I like to give you guys a heads up. So I'm not a total shock, but anyway. Uh, Joe, it's been fun recording with you today, and uh, and uh, we're getting ready to record another one, so uh, Carrie won't even be on that one. <laughs> but what the deal is, at the end of the uh, at the month, we have our big uh, topic episode, and we definitely need Gary uh, to fill his uh, very tiny shoes <laughs> that he wears. <laughs> and so we we want him to be there for that one, so we won't be able to record to that day because it's a long day of recording to pull that off. So. Anyway, uh, Joe and I are going to click off here. We'll come right back next week, but in reality, it'll be just a few seconds, and we'll record two episodes this afternoon. Anyway, stay sweaty, my friends. Uh, Don't forget to shower. Train hard. Train Train smart. smart. (laughs) (laughs) Get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats. I I forgot to mention that uh, Nikki Sullivan, uh, uh, Autos Black Belt, uh, will be uh, our interview next week. So really excited to bring you guys, Nikki. It was a great interview. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do 
Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.